Scripture today comes from Luke 21, 5 through 19. Jesus speaks about the future. Some of his disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the wall. But Jesus said, the time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they asked, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? He replied, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and saying, the time has come. But don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yet these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all of this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you, and everyone will hate you because you are my followers, but not a hair on your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, open our hearts to your word. May your Holy Spirit teach us, lead us, guide us, convict us, Lord, of the sin that lives in our lives. May we truly be blessed by your words. May the words that I share be lifted up with honor and glory to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Interesting scripture, isn't it? One that you love or one that you kind of really don't want to look at. Too difficult. Not sure I'm all in for the suffering and the pain and the trials. And... But Jesus said, this is what is coming. What is your temple? I remember thinking back many, many years ago when I was six or seven years old, my Mom and dad, my brother and my sister, all came to the Black Hills for the very first time. We stopped in the Badlands and drove through and we saw the prairie dogs. What awful creatures. Oh, no, wait a minute, that's a farmer's perspective, isn't it? We saw the beauty of the Badlands, the uniqueness of the colors and the changing colors. And then we went to Mount Rushmore. Four faces on a mountain. How many of you have been there? How many of you have seen it change over the years? Well, the mountain never changes, but the viewing platform does, doesn't it? I remember walking up there in the old days with my mom and dad and brother and sister and standing there with my mouth wide open just looking at the magnificence of Mount Rushmore. How did they have that vision? How could they carve this beautiful, beautiful figures of our history? I was awestruck by the beauty of Mount Rushmore. That night we went down to Keystone and we got a camping spot where we could see Mount Rushmore in the, in the morning. First thing, we got up and we looked at Mount Rushmore once again. Deb and I brought our children to Mount Rushmore. We brought every one of our grandchildren to Mount Rushmore. The viewing platform has changed, but the mountain is the same as it was in the 30s when it was constructed. Over 60 years, and nothing has really changed. Well, today we look at the Scripture as the disciples are looking at the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And they're looking at it in that same way with awe and magnificence. 
They marveled at how it was adorned with the gifts of the people. The disciples were witnessing the magnitude of God's house, the temple. Now this was the third temple that had been built since the first one. It took 46 years to construct this temple. It was four football fields in width, five football fields in length, and it stood as tall as a 15-story building. There were portions of the temple covered in pure gold. It was marble and it was white. And there were times when you couldn't look at the magnificence of the temple because it was so brilliant in the sunlight. It was an amazing structure, especially for that day. Now Jesus and the disciples had arrived in Jerusalem and they had spent much time in the temple. It was here that Jesus cleared the temple of the merchants selling their wares. It was here that Jesus denounced the scribes and the Pharisees. It was here that Jesus commended the generosity of the poor widow and her two mites. It was here in the temple that Jesus tells the disciples what is to happen in the future. And they really didn't want to hear it. As Jesus stood listening to the disciples talking about the beauty of the temple, he proclaims, all this you see, the time will come when not a single stone here will be left in its place. Everyone will be thrown down. Now if my father had told me that as we stood looking at Mount Rushmore, I don't believe I would have believed him. The mountain would change, would be gone. Couldn't happen. Well, the disciples had difficulty understanding what Jesus was trying to teach them. They had just witnessed Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on that what we call Palm Sunday. The crowds of people proclaimed Jesus Christ was King, Savior, Messiah. Surely Jesus had come to become that earthly king they so desired. The disciples would surely one day reign in this beautiful temple in an earthly kingdom. So they asked Jesus, well, when will all these things happen? What sign should we look for concerning this destruction? And again, Jesus uses their questions to teach of the coming events. He tells the disciples that in the final days, you will see false prophets, political chaos, natural disasters, acts of war. Sound familiar? We don't know for sure if Jesus was teaching only of the destruction of the temple or if he was teaching of that day when Jesus will return once again. But history tells us that the Romans in 70 A.D. destroyed this very temple. The entire city of Jerusalem was burned. Everything was destroyed. There was not a stone left on top of another stone. The prophecy had been fulfilled. But Jesus continued to prepare his disciples for what was ahead of them. Have you ever thought of what it would be like to know what the future holds? How many of you would like to know what the future holds? I don't know, do I? Jeff is right. If it's good, I want to know. If it's bad, I really don't want to know. I'm really not sure what's for lunch today. But my wife said, I will have lunch for you. Because she knew I'd go to McDonald's or something. 
Do we really want to know what the future holds? Well, there's one point in the future that we all want to be aware of. The future of when this body is done and we step into eternity. We know that is coming and we know for certainty what that future can be if our heart, if our mind is rooted in Jesus Christ. Jesus knew what lay ahead for Himself, but He also knew what was going to happen to the disciples. And Jesus said, they will lay hands on you and they will persecute you they will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. Now the disciples must have been shocked. How could Jesus say this? They were following the king of the Jews. They were taught Jesus would be their earthly king. He'd be teaching with them in this most beautiful temple. Their security had been placed in Jesus as an earthly king. And they felt invincible. But Jesus was challenging what they'd put their hope and trust in. So what have you put your hope and your trust in? If Jesus were to say to you today that you would suffer for your faith, that your friends, even your family, would turn on you because of your faith, what would your reaction be? When challenges come, we often turn to the security we feel in our own lives. For many, that might be a, a good job, a nice income, a great home, a wonderful, loving family, our health. We often look for security in the world around us. We put our trust in the things of the world. The disciples trusted that Jesus would always be with them. Yet Jesus revealed that he would also be destroyed just as the temple. Lord, say it's not so. In the second chapter of John, then the Jews demanded of him, Jesus, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus was not talking about the, the humanly built temple on the Temple Mount. He was talking about His body, which is, which was, the temple of God. And the disciples just could not understand. Our scripture concludes with Jesus telling the disciples that not a hair of your head will perish. Now I like that. I like that. He said by standing firm you will gain life. Yet we know that all the disciples except for John died a horrible martyr's death. Jesus told the disciples they must not put their trust in the things of the world. The temple, the magnificent temple, was destroyed. Not a stone left. Jesus Himself was crucified, died on the cross, and the disciples' lives were turned upside down. Everything the disciples had put their trust in, all the things that had given them security, security were now changing. Jesus knew what awaited the disciples, but he also saw 
the heart of the disciples. So we ask the question, where is your temple today? What have you put your faith or your hope in? Your families, your spouse, your wealth, your home? What if it was all gone tomorrow? 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? You know, the only thing that you have that is yours, that is permanently yours, is your soul. You understand that? I've got pants and a shirt on, but they're not mine. I have flesh and bones, but they're not mine. The only thing that I control, that I have, is my soul and what I do with my soul. Everything else is just stuff. Paul said we are all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. But God, at a tremendous price, has forgiven and paid for our sins. When Jesus said to the disciples, not a hair on your head shall be lost, he was referring to their soul and to their eternal life. Our bodies will certainly die. We spend billions every year on youthful items. The commercial on TV says if you do this, you will get your youth back. Folks, it doesn't work. 100%. It doesn't work. Even that television preacher that sends me $1,000 and I'll sell you the oil that will keep you youthful forever is lying to you. Because this body will die. Oh, that's hard to understand, isn't it? Surely not me. I'm just young. Maybe those older people but not me, Lord. Not me. But God has given us that one thing that no one can touch. And that is our souls. And where we entrust our soul is where we will spend all of eternity. Jesus, who was the temple of God, was humanly put to death. Jesus died a physical death, but on the third day he was raised from death in victory. If we trust in Jesus Christ, when all our earthly treasures and all our temples are destroyed, we can rest in the everlasting arms of God for all eternity. And no one can take that from us. For the last six months of his life, my dad taught me what a joy it is to die. And I said, oh, dad, dad. He said, Barry, listen to me. He said, the greatest moment of your life will be when Jesus comes calling and takes you home to be with him. But that only happens when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, then no matter what happens to this earthly body, no one can touch our soul, for it belongs to our Lord and to our Savior. The story is told of a Shakespearean actor who was known throughout the world for his one-man show of readings and recitations from the classics. Every night he would end his performance with the dramatic reading of the 23rd Psalm. Each night, without exception, as the actor began his recitation, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The crowd was listened intently. 
And then at the conclusion of the psalm, they would rise in thunderous applause, in appreciation of the actor's ability to bring the verse to life. But then one night, while on tour, before the actor was to offer his customer, customary recital of the 23rd Psalm, a young man from the audience spoke up, Excuse me, sir, do you mind if I recite the 23rd Psalm? The actor was stunned. The interruptions and this unusual request were so strange. But he allowed the young man to come forward and to stand front and center on the stage to recite the 23rd Psalm. Knowing that the ability of this unskilled youth would be no match for his own talent. With a soft voice, the younger man began to recite the words of the 23rd Psalm. When he was finished, there were no applause. There was no standing ovation as on the other nights. All that could be heard was the sound of weeping. The audience had been so moved by the young man's recitation that every eye was filled with tears. Amazed by what he had heard, the actor said to the youth, I don't understand. I've been performing the 23rd Psalm for years. I have a lifetime of experience and training, but I've never been able to move an audience as you have tonight. Tell me, what is your secret? The young man humbly replied, Well, sir, you know the Psalm, but I know the shepherd. And that makes all the difference. I was reminded in Laramore, North Dakota, on a cold, cold night, I was called to the nursing home. Henry had just lost his wife of 60 plus years. And Henry was hurting, and, and they called and they asked me if I would pray with Henry. And I came to the nursing home, two or three in the morning. It was dark and it was cold and I was tired. and I didn't want to be there. But Henry needed me. So I went into the room and Henry was there and Henry said, Pastor, will you pray with me? I said, absolutely. And he said, no. He said, I'll pray. Let's get on our knees by Dorothy's bed. And so we did. And Henry recited the 23rd Psalm to his wife as she went to be with the Lord. I've never been so moved by a man who knew the Spirit of God. Dorothy was a beautiful woman. Henry has went on to live for many, many more years. And I heard that night that Henry knew the psalm, but he knew the shepherd and the Savior. If you know the Savior, then you will know where to put your hope and your trust. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us to know the shepherd. Help us to see beyond the trappings of the world Help us to understand that an intimate knowledge of Jesus Christ in our heart and in our mind leads us to that place of eternal rest forever and ever in your arms. We thank you, Lord, for the saints who have went before. We thank you for the faithfulness that they have shown us. And we pray, Lord, that you will, will solidify in us what we put our hope and our trust in. Amen and amen. Will you stand with me for our benediction? It's a hard question this morning, isn't it? Where do we put our trust? I trust my van will still be in the parking lot. I trust it'll start. I trust I'll get lunch. 
I trust, I trust, but you never know when God may call you home. Put your hope and your trust in the living God and your Savior, Jesus Christ.